I've got people ask me how to do a gauge R&R study on a clock or some precision scales. Look, people, those tools are accurate enough. You are not going to catch them with an R&R. Get something where people are much more involved and you'll have a good case to do a repeatability and reproducibility study. Hello, I'm Tom. Welcome to my channel where we talk about continuous improvement in an industrial setting. And today's video, it's about R&R, repeatability, rep reproducibility, and this is part of measurement systems analysis, MSA, gauge r &R. Now, one of the things that, that sort of bothers me is um, people asking me how to do it uh, even on OEE calculation. So um, for all of you thinking about uh, how to do gauge r &R on my OEE, don't just don't, it's, it's not meant for that. But also a lot of people trying to do this on a basically perfect system. So uh, a clock to measure time, for instance, yeah, really, if, especially if it's one of those digital number clocks, they are accurate enough, really. You are not going to use r, &R statistics to see that the clock might not be ideal for your measurement of work time or something like that. Now, what you are looking at is um, a measurement system where especially people have relatively a lot of influence. So this can be that the measurement itself uh, is difficult to read, um, but what you will also see is that the preparation of an analysis uh, is more involved, is more difficult. Um, many laboratory um, analyses, they have not just reading what is on a display, because that part is easy. I hope that when there is a set of numbers on a display, that any trained laboratory staff will read it and get the same number of the display, right? It's about the prep work before. So if you have a lot of work to do to sample it the correct way, then uh, take a sample from that sample, mix it for 15 minutes, then let it aerate for five minutes and then put it into your spectrometer without any light hitting it, things like that. Then you have a lot of steps that could go wrong and then it becomes interesting. But the other thing is when it really is difficult to read. So, Let's get a couple of ideas and, and let's start with one. Uh, I have talked about it before, but this is uh, really from practice. Uh, and this is about, uh, it's, it's an Emmental type of cheese we made. And uh, an Emmental type of cheese has these big holes, right? So you need nice big holes uh, and you also uh, always get some small ones. So we had this test. When you cut the cheese before slicing, you take this one pane that you cut and you count the number of holes bigger than one centimeter. And we had a couple of things here. So uh, you would say, well, it's easy to count holes bigger than a centimeter. First of all, which ones are bigger than a centimeter? I mean, you basically do this on your eye. So just by looking at it, right, uh, one, two, three, four, five, probably. Now this one, I don't know if you can see it on the small video, but it's like two holes that grew together into a sort of an eight. Does it count as one or as two? Question. The official rule, by the way, was it's one hole, but um, of course, different operators interpret this differently. Uh, this one, is it bigger or not? Uh, these, do you count them? Yes or no? Now, what we saw is that um, there was quite a high spread in the number of holes counted in that cheese, which is sort of logical because it's a, uh, it's a biological product, right? It's a organic growth. So you expect some variation there. But what we also saw is that the number of holes in the cheese depended on which shift did the slicing. Now, that, of course, cannot be. Uh, well, it could be, but it's very unlikely. So the person counting the holes who was in a shift at the slicing factory, well, they were probably counting in a different way. So we did a test, we gave them the same cheeses, a number of those counters, uh, and we asked them how many holes are in this cheese, because that was the official thing, and they should themselves discount any holes under a centimeter, count those double holes as one, stuff like that. And um, this is a nice setup for a gauge r, &R. And now you might be saying, well, this is a strange gauge, right? It, it's a strange measuring device. There's so many more precise ways to measure this. For instance, you could uh, give a good uh, ruler and get in here with the pinches and really measure all of them. But it takes too long. And that, if you got this sort of simple type of measurement, then you are in the exact correct place for doing a gauge r, &R study. Because if you already have the best measuring tool 
available on the market and you are spending all the time and resources that you have on it and then you find out that it is not precise enough for your production process, what are you going to do? Put your R&D team on finding a new measurement tool? No, you're just going to accept it. But when you are using a, a quick analysis method, like just counting, you know, by R, you cut the cheese, you count the number of holes, write it down. This is quick and cheap. But is it good enough? Now, what came out of this study, by the way, is that it was not good enough. There was quite a serious difference between the operators. So we did two things. One is training, and this is nice, right? So uh, that, that's also when you want to do gauge r and if you expect a human factor. But we did training, and we did one more thing. We gave them this cheese slicer. And they needed a cheese slicer anyway to slice off some strange places if they would occur, and the, um, uh, the marking on top. But also we drilled a one centimeter hole into the cheese slicer so that you can check which of these holes is actually smaller than the hole that you have in the tool that is there anyway. And suddenly the R&R of this uh, measurement system shot up tremendously and it was good enough for our purposes, more than good enough actually after that. It was a really good count. Um, other systems, um, you, you might be familiar with um, titration in a laboratory. You have a lot of chemical and biological processes are checked by then titrating uh, an acid or a base or some other reactant into a sample to see when things change. Or, and it's, a, it's a pretty common way to analyze samples in a chemical way. And one of the things, especially the manual way to do this, You have this titer and then uh, you drip in some of the liquid and what at some point happens is that there, there is your base liquid here and then it does this. The fluid level in such a titration pipe, in such a titer, is not completely straight. Due to surface tension this makes a bit of a, a concave surface. Now how do you read it? So is it the top line? Or is it the bottom? And you have a number of mistakes that you can make in this whole analysis. The first one's actually already being with making sure you have enough sample with the proper uh, reactives. You watch for a color change usually in this type of stuff. Uh, how much do you drip out before you see the color change? So there's a lot of things that can go wrong there, but the most obvious one is, are you reading the top or the bottom? So that one uh, is a very nice one to do a gauge r and r on. And also, um, let's say human censoring, and, uh, and this I think is already close to human censoring, but the real human sensor type of thing is when you feel if something is straight or strong or tough or not. Uh, so um, let's take a bread dough or something like that. Right, excuse my, uh, my drawing skills today, but anyway, we're, we're pushing and we're trying to see is this dough or this bread or uh, we actually use the same idea also in, um, uh, in, in cheese curd. Is the thing that I'm making strong enough at the moment? Because when you push, it, it's uh, how do you measure it anyway, right? Uh, you feel the force back on your finger, you feel how it behaves. But this, this type of measuring, how firm is my material? Is it almost ready for baking? Is it baked? Uh, is it ready for the next step? How did it mix? Um, think of a mozzarella that has to stretch, uh, but also think of all kinds of plastics. Now, you have, of course, very expensive equipment to really stretch or push or break a product in a very tested uh, way, very controlled way. But just pushing it, is a lot cheaper. So here you have the ideal example of what you can do and where you can use uh, a gauge r and to see if this quick and dirty way, and well, in this case hopefully not dirty, definitely if this is a food product, but if this quick way is good enough for your production process. Now you know that the special stretchy machine is the, the real, the final test, and even there uh, in that field of analysis 
what you will see a lot is that th these type of machines, they are uh, very difficult to also set and to prepare the samples to put into such a machine is, is very difficult. So they are not as uh, repeatable as you would have liked. But this type of, you know, just pushing, squeezing type of test, uh, that one is a very difficult one to get straight. But what you will see is that if you have experienced operators, they can do it, right? Uh, and uh, you will probably in practice, uh, because these are the cheap production tests, uh, be like, yeah, this is good enough or not. So this is a pass, not pass type of test. What you want to do with that to make a better gauge RNR is to make a scale. So you are going to say, usually we have, yeah, it's good enough or no, it's not good enough. But we're going to add things like, this is a bit firmer than needed, but still okay. Or this is really a lot firmer, or this is too firm. But also the other way, this is not as firm as I would have liked it, but the product goes on. So you can make a number scale out of it. And to do the calculations afterwards, you definitely have to. But um, you can explain the number scale in such a way, right? Always give especially your experienced people who are not too experienced with laboratory analyses or statistics, but who are very experienced with your product, give them a scale that they can feel, that they can understand, like a bit firmer than usual, too firm. And then you make this distinction. And so a number of them are still good. And then it goes to too hard or it goes to too soft. Uh, and make sure that they, they make a bit more than just the okay or not okay. And then give it to more people and uh, give it to them after training and have the discussion. And this way, um, of course, the same samples you also send to your technologist, uh, to your lab systems, to whatever you use to check in the end if it's okay. And then you compare them. But the first thing you do is, can we make different people to at least score the same? So if they would all score that it is pretty firm, but still good, and they are all very consistent on, it, on this. So it's repeatable and reproducible. But then your laboratory equipment uh, and your official tests by, I don't know, the Trade Commission or whatever, say, uh, says that it is quite weak. Okay, you can retrain your people. But the most important thing you already know, and that is we can get a whole group of people to assess it in the same way. That also means that we can change the scale a bit and have them all still assess in the same way on a slightly different scale. So just move their result, calibrate what our human sensors are doing. Just looking at your product, counting some stuff or checking the color, uh, pushing, um, feeling, things like that are typical production gauges, production measurement systems. And those are the ones people check those with an R&R study. So uh, uh, <laughs> I would say next time that um, you want to write in the, uh, in the YouTube comments and please do, do continue to write, right? Uh, but if you are thinking of uh, you know, your Six Sigma uh, exam uh, project or some school project or even better, in industry, a real project, think about these type of things for a measurement systems analysis. Think about where is the sample preparation difficult. Think about where is, what should I count? A bit arbitrary. So formally there are rules, but <laughs> you know that people can mess up or that you really use the, our human senses, sensory analysis that is tasting a product, definitely also in this category, by the way, but pushing or uh, checking a color or tasting, things like that. Th those are really, really good for a gauge r and they are good for two reasons. And that's also, um, let's, let, let's spend a, a bit of thought on that as well. Why do you do a measurement systems analysis? It is not to prove that a perfect system is perfect or to prove that a horrendous system is horrendous. You want to get the sweet spot, right? You, you want to know, is this system good enough for us? Especially if you have this discussion within your management quality department technology. So you get this, um, we now have our operators just pushing the bread to see if it is baked or not. 
but actually we should be putting a thermometer in there and logging it throughout the baking process and getting a lot of physics and statistics and make sure that we have this completely controlled. Yeah, well, maybe, but let's check. Here is the why do we spend, because it will take time to do a, a proper gauge r, &R. Why do we spend the time to see if our quick method is good enough? To see if when we have different options, also if you do not have different options, forget about the gauge r, &R because you're not going to change anyway. When you have different options, then you want to check, are those options good enough? Because what, as soon as they are good enough, um, if and you know, right, and, and when you do an r, &R and you get to the point that less than 10% of the observed variance is due to the measurement system, we would say you have a world-class measurement system. This is good enough with a bow tie around it. Now, if it is less than 30% of the observed variance comes from your measurement system, the general accepted rule for an RNR is still to say this is good enough. And especially for a high frequency test, like the ones we do in production in the process, 30%, that is your, your goal, so to say, to be lower than 30% in an RNR test. So that's what you are looking for. Can my uh, cheap and easy to use in production at the line measuring system provide me data that is good enough for my purposes? Because these, well, this one may be a bit, but <laughs> the in control, good, not good, uh, do I have to correct my system a little bit, my recipes, my machines a little bit, that is the type of test that is very operational. You don't get uh, long-term statistical data from it, usually. Uh, you just want it to be good enough. So a 20 or 30% of your observed variance is due to such a measurement system is good enough. And you go for the easy test that you can do a lot, where you can also put the testing at the hands of the operator operating the line instead of some quality department that is not really mixed in with production. So for next time you are thinking of where to do a gauge r, &R uh, how to improve my quality. So think of these things, think of the, the human sensor things, think of the human influence on a more formal analysis type of measurement systems. Those are ideal candidates for doing a gauge r, &R study, but also let's be practical and think the other way around. I want you to know that when you have in your production these type of measurements where you rely on human senses, where you have a lot of steps that can change a bit between people or uh, are really, you know, they can introduce variation in the result. Those are the ideal measurement systems to do an R&R study on. Don't study clocks, they are good enough, but these guys, that is where the real magic happens, where you can really help your quality system by doing a proper repeatability and reproducibility study. Now, I hope you liked this video. I hope it gave you some ideas. If it did, don't forget to hit that like button. But also, drop me a comment. You know, what type of, this type of processes do you have in your operation? And um, what would be a good one for me to sort of make a calculating example also from, or to explain a bit more how to do an R&R &R in a specific practical case? Write me a comment below. I'll be happy to discuss it further with you. For now, I wish you the best of luck improving your measurement systems. And as always, enjoy the improvement journey.